Good morning, everyone. Uh, very happy to be here and uh, to give this uh, keynote. Uh, so I'm going to talk about sky computing. And this is a work we've been doing at at Berkeley, where we started a lab uh, last year, a new lab. And this follows a few other lab we did at Berkeley before, uh, RISE lab and before AM lab, and includes a pretty large number of faculties, around eight faculties, and around 50 students and postdocs. And we have a list of great sponsors there. So, this talk, in this talk, I'm going to try to answer three questions. Uh, what is Kai? Why and how we believe sky will happen? Uh, what is the big deal about sky if it happens? And then I'll conclude with some early experience with sky. Oops. So over 45 years ago, um, on November 22nd, 77, um, there was the first internet demo. And in this internet demo, the packets, some data packets were sent from Menlo Park, from the internet radio, through an internet radio network, to ISI Institute in uh, LA. And the distance, the geographic distance is pretty small, but in this demo, the packets traveled across two continents and three networks. Different kind of networks, a radio network, ARPANET, which is a wire network, and a satellite network. And the great thing about this was that demo was that the internet abstracted away different networks, technologies. So the senders and receivers had no idea what kind of technologies was used to carry these packets. So one way to look at sky, uh, it's maybe one way it's internet for the clouds, or a set of software tools and services which tries to make it easy, uh, ideally transparent, to run application across multiple clouds. That's basically what it is. Uh, so why Sky? Why do we care about that? Well, because users ask more and more for the ability to run their applications across multiple clouds. So, and there are multiple reasons for that. Uh, one, it's uh, satisfied data and operational sovereignty. Um, operational sovereignty means that you should process your data not only within the boundaries of a country, but also on a data center, uh, which is managed by the nationals of that country. So you, you may have no choice about where to process some data. Then you want to use the best of, of breed in terms of the services and hardware which are available across clouds. As you know now, more and more clouds come with their own silicon to accelerate different workloads like machine learning. Obviously, you know TensorFlow Processing Unit from Google, Trainium from AWS, and we are just starting. Every major cloud will have its own uh, chips. And you really want the ability to use this shift because they, are, they have different performance profiles, so they are going to be better matched for different workloads. Then you want to aggregate resources across clouds. And we are, with the machine learning, we are an era of scarcity for the GPUs. Um, I heard the other day that the H100 from, AWA, from, from NVIDIA uh, are sold up to Q1 next year, if you want any kind of Pretty, you know, reasonably large number of these uh, GPUs. So you want the ability then to use whatever is available across multiple clouds. Obviously, you want to reduce the cost and latency. And finally, large enterprises, they want to avoid locking to a single cloud. Now, um, Sky actually is not a new idea. You may have heard us about multi-cloud all the time. And actually, it's also this paper from 2015, eight years ago, um, about sky computing. And without going into details, um, 
this, the idea here is that you are going to implement this portability layer over every cloud. So every cloud provides portability layer. You are going to write application against this portability layer, and then your application are going to learn, to, are going to run over every cloud. Um, and there are a few other proposals since then. Um, Nimbus, the same idea, you have a portability layer, and even more recent proposals coming from Google of Azure, Azure Arc and Google Antos, uh, which is based on Kubernetes, it's again, they provide this kind of layers of abstractions you can use to write uh, your application, redevelop your application, and run it across different, uh, different clouds. And this kind of architecture shouldn't come as a surprise, because this is what we are taught and we are teaching uh, our own students that layering is the kind of method to abstract away the, the differences in the hardware and services provided by the low, lower layers. Of course, the most, one of the most famous is a narrow waste, internet narrow waste, uh, which is uh, IP. And also in the operating system, you have the ser service call interface, um, which is abstracts away maybe the differences in the hardware and the services which are provided below. However, despite this kind of natural architecture and the efforts, uh, pre uh, previous efforts, we had little success so far. So why is that? Of course, when something doesn't work, you can find a lot of explanation. The same when something is working. Uh, but we do believe that there are a few of them here. Um, so this portability layer turns out to be very, very complex. Um, uh, Mark Rusonovich, <laughs> talking with him, it's from, who is the CTO at Azure, of Azure at Microsoft. He was saying, well, it's very hard because if you look about the functionality you need to provide in this layer, it will be like 10 times you know, larger or higher than uh, an OS. And with OS, there are efforts actually in the Unix world um, at the end of uh, 90s, so a long time ago, tried to kind of unify it was OS F1, a bunch of uh, different Unix implementations. Um, and it wasn't uh, that kind of successful. Um, then, the portability layer is actually typically low level. So this means that you do not have access to many services which are provided by today's clouds. AWS alone provides over 200, 300 services. Um, and the application wants to use these services. Uh, so the, now if you have this portability layer, you, the only one you, you can be kind of portable across clouds is to re-implement the services on top of this, uh, of this layer. And finally, clouds don't really have an incentive to support it because a low, la a low uh, level layer would commoditize them, okay? So how is our approach, ap approach different? So the way we are looking at this problem is that instead of trying to come up with this portability layer, which is going to be implemented over by every cloud, um, you can think about it's like, um, like a two-sided market. So on one hand, you have a bunch of services. And this, some of the services can be implemented by multiple clouds. And some of the services are implemented by a single cloud. And on the other hand, um, you have applications which specify which services they want to use. And then if a service is provided by multiple clouds, you can you pick one or the other clouds depending on the application uh, you know, preferences or requirements. So that's basically the main idea. And we, we group this kind of services here with what we call the incompatibility set. So, which are services this, this application can use. Um, so you may ask, okay, what are these services? Oh, so here are a few examples. Um, and I, I, have, I have here two axes about open source and whether the uh, services based on open source or proprietary code or, and whether it's provided by the cloud themselves or provided by third parties. And here in the lowest quadrant, open source uh, based services provided by the clouds, you have quite a few and you know them, you know, based on open source projects like Kubernetes, Apache Spark, um, um, 
Kafka, and so forth. Uh, in the upper uh, left quadrant, you have uh, services which are provided by third party based on the open source, and you have these companies behind this open source project, uh, which provide the services actually across multiple clouds, like uh, you know, Databricks, Confluent, uh, MongoDB, and so forth. Um, on the proprietary side, uh, services provided by the clouds, you can actually you have most of the services are provided only by that part, one particular cloud, but there are a few of them, there are a few exceptions. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, Azure Arc, Antos, and even uh, Google BigQueries, which you can run ac across multiple clouds. Uh, and finally, you have proprietary services provided by the third party across multiple clouds, like Snowflakes or VMware, vSphere, and so forth. That's kind of basically the services which are actually available today you can use. So let me take a, 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 a simple example to illustrate about what Sky is, how it's going to work and what it's doing. So here is a very simple machine learning pipeline, right? It's three stages. You do some data preprocessing or processing, uh, then you do some training, you train a model, and then you serve the model, right? Um, and let's say we have, we want to, we have this kind of clouds uh, we want to run our service on, and in between is Sky, which tries to abstract away these clouds. Also assume that the application, you know, the user, when runs this pipeline, you know, wants to um, has certain requirements. So, for instance, the data has some confidential PII information, PII uh, data, which wants to remove before passing the data to the training uh, stage. Um, and also, the user wants to minimize the cost. Um, so one way to do it and to take advantage of these clouds is as follows. Uh, you can use Azure Confidential Computing, provides hardware enclaves for secure data processing to remove the PII. Um, then you can use maybe TPUs on Google to train the model. And to serve the model, maybe use AWS Inferential Service. Right? Um, so does it work? You know, is it worth doing it? So here it's a very simple, again, example. Uh, using uh, UE fine-tune BERT, then, and, and then after we fine-tune BERT, we, the model, the fine-tune model, um, we do batch inference for 10,000 uh, queries. So now, if you need to run it only off, as you can run it only on one cloud, that cloud is going to be Azure, because at, that, at least at the time when we did this experiment, it was the only one to provide uh, hardware enclaves um, and it was through Azure uh, Confidential Computing. And again, I want hardware enclaves in this case to remove the PII information. In this case, we assume that we have the data, it's a kind of review data, uh, and uh, you have one of the columns, it's a user identity, uh, user I represent user IDs, and we want to remove that column before training. So if you do that, you have this kind of time and the cost. And now what happens if you use uh, Sky? Well, if you use Sky, you can get both lower cost and actually you do it faster. Um, you reduce the time by 47% and the cost by 60%, over 60%. And obviously, in the cloud with the pay-as-you-go model, you have this kind of nice correlation between the time it takes something to be done and how much it costs, right? Because you pay only for how much you run. Um, and by the way, just to make sure, this also takes into account the egress cost, egress fees, so the cost of transfer between the clouds. The key component of Sky is this kind of intercloud broker, which actually is doing the mapping between the application's uh, requirements and preferences and the clouds. Um, which implements the services requested by the application. Uh, and there can be multiple interclouds, brokers. Um, um, there can be, you know, different organizations can, pro can provide their own intercloud brokers. Uh, there can be intercloud brokers for different application domains and things like that. If you look under the hood, 
The InterCloud Broker has a few key components. It has a, a service catalog. And the service catalog has a list of services which are running on different clouds. This includes the cost and the API, how to start a service, how to tear down a service, uh, how to configure a service, and things like that. Okay. Um, then one of the central part is the optimizer. So you can take, okay, I can, so you have, yeah, so you, I don't know what happens here. I see you, I see on, uh, I see my, uh, the slides on my screen. Um, so by the way, so you, you basically, you can specify the application. The application you can specify The application, you can specify the application like as a DAG, direct access with graph, where the components in the DAG are pretty, pretty large uh, components. They are not only tasks. Think about, um, think about like um, stages, like I mentioned in the previous application, like data processing stage or things like that. Um, okay, thank you. And the optimizer takes this uh, specification of the application and takes the um, preferences and requirements from the users and based on what services are available, is going to compute a physical plane and is going to run different components on different clouds. Okay. Um, and finally, there is a bill, one uh, another big component is billing, right? So, and there are two ways to do the billing. First of all, and the easiest way is a user has already accounts with different clouds and then specifying, it specifies to the intercloud brokers which clouds it can use. Um, and the other way, it's a little bit harder, but it's more transparent. The InterCloud Broker can implement the billing, so it's going to have InterCloud Broker, it's going to have accounts with multiple clouds, and it's going to be charged by these clouds and execute the jobs from the user, and then it's going to charge back the user. Okay, so this is a little bit about what Sky is. So now, why, why do we believe that Sky will happen? We, we know when we started the research, everyone, you know, a lot of people telling us that this will not happen because major clouds will not this to happen, right? Uh, because maybe about fear of commoditization. We have three reasons, conjectures, why we believe this will happen. First, the compatibility set is growing quickly. The second, Sky can start with no help from existing clouds. We can start it today. And we believe that once started, market forces will do the rest. Compatibility set is growing quickly. I mentioned about the open, open source software being the backbone of this compatibility set. Um, as you know, there are open source projects right now which even dominates the different layers of the stack from the resource orchestrations and uh, data processing and things like that. And there are more and more of these open source projects. Um, third parties, um, the third parties which provide their services on top of the existing clouds, they actually want to run their services across multiple clouds. Why? One, of course, because they can increase their reach in terms of market reach, more customers if you can run your service on multiple clouds. But the other thing is that it puts them in a better competitive position with respect to the public clouds because the public clouds, they can typically provide the service only on that particular cloud, while, uh, while these uh, third parties can say, my service is available on multiple clouds, so you are not necessarily, you don't need to choose a cloud to run my service. And there are many examples here, Confluent, Databricks, Snowflake, and this is the number of, of companies providing their services or multiple clouds is just growing. Uh, finally, actually, the clouds themselves want it, and they are growing this compatibility set. Um, they provide it 
uh, hosted versions of op or the major open source models, if there is uh, open source project, if there is a successful open source project, the clouds are going to provide a hosted service of that project. Um, like I mentioned, they provide their own software stack, or they try to, you know, on top of other clouds, like Azure Arc and Google Antos. And you may ask, why do they do that? Well, the reason for doing that is because they do believe that at the end of the day, uh, this kind of service, like Antos, will run the best on a particular on GCP, for instance. So if you develop the application, say in this case, on AWS using Antos or Azure, at the end, the best implementation of Antos will be on GCP, so that will create incentives for you to eventually to migrate to this GCP. <laughs> and finally, um, they are also have incentives to support the competitor APIs. Um, so for instance, you are Azure, and you want to get a big customer which is currently running on AWS. Okay? So one of the biggest barriers in doing so is that the customer is telling you, well, you know, I, I, I love you, and I love your prices, I love everything about what you are telling me, but I need to do quite a bit of work in taking my applications and actually retuning, re-implementing on top of your, on Azure, on top of your services. And what do you think that Azure is going to tell you then? Well, you know, it's not that different, right? You don't need to do a lot of such work. You use S3, you know, blob store is, our blob store is quite similar. And by the way, if you, we have also the shim layer, uh, you don't need to do any core changes, right? You're just going to do to be better. Um, and I did, um, at, at Databricks, actually, we, a um, few years back, we, we were first only AWS, and then we had, a, we implemented Azure service. And uh, going from AWS to Azure uh, with, uh, you know, for the Databricks service was, you know, a big job. It was a few tens of engineers almost for one year. And uh, I went back to, this was, this was happening five, six years ago, and I went back to the engineer who led this transition, and I asked, let's think last year or two years ago, basically asked, you know, if you were to do it again, would that be easier or harder? And the answer was clearly it will be easier. Why? Because there is more commonality between the AWS infrastructure and Azure infrastructure um, in 20, whatever, 20, to then in 2016. Um, Sky needs no help from existing clouds to happen. Um, we can start with an open source intercloud broker and uh, can start with the easy cases. You don't start, need to start with all the application under the sun. Uh, and actually, so what we've done, we started to build a prototype for uh, machine learning workloads, training, tuning, and serving. And we do have the user. We understand the user as well, our own students uh, uh, who have uh, credits from multiple clouds. Now, every cloud gives you a little bit of credits. Now, the question is about how to use these credits. So uh, at least for these workloads, uh, Sky will make it easy to do so. And we'll, I'll discuss a little bit later about our experience with this. Uh, finally, once started, we do believe that market will do the rest. Um, so again, like I mentioned, we can start it today, and we can implement some services or applications. And therefore, by definition, these services or applications are going to run across multiple clouds. So they can become part of this compatibility set. Uh, but not only that, if the, if the application are popular, then other clouds are incentivized to provide some, this kind of, uh, to be part of Sky to compete for these workloads and applications, right? So this will create and reach the compatibility set and reach the number of uh, clouds which participate to Sky, which will incentivize even more services which will grow the Sky ecosystem. At least this is a help. Now, let me say what Sky doesn't try to do, right? I told you whatever Sky is doing, so let me say what it doesn't do. So Sky doesn't try to define a uniform standard API for all clouds, like I mentioned. 
Again, it's too hard and clear it, whether it is even feasible. Just as a reminder, Cloud API is much more complex than OSS API. Uh, clouds may be not incentivized to provide this uniform standard to adhere to a uniform standard for a fear of commodization. And even if they do it, it's a standardization effort that takes many, many years for such a complex layer. It doesn't, it doesn't even try to impose standards for some services, like same storage API or things like that. Instead, what Sky assumes is that the API is a code. So the question is, what is the API? It's a version of the code. Think about Spark 3.2 or Kubernetes 1.8. That version gives you whatever the API. Um, it's, it's a way to think about similar like libraries, right? You know, you use a library, you know the API which is in that library, you specify what the version you have, you want to use, and you are ready to go. Um, now, it's possible, of course, and we are doing that some Shimler to provide some abstract away and to provide some of the differences. But we, be, what we, do, is, we do believe that this layer will be, like I said, just Shimler, it will be very thin layers. So writing a Sky application, the way to think about the best way I can, I can explain um, is that it's similar to writing a program. You just replace the library with a service, right? Uh, these developers are responsible for specifying the service, its version, configuration parameters, if any, uh, manage conflicts and dependencies. And yes, I know this is messy, but we do today with libraries, although you have this, uh, many articles about dependency hell, and you know, we try to solve that. But the point is that despite the messiness, and maybe it's a little bit even more messier, programmers, developers, handle it today. So it's a good start, good enough start. Um, the intercloud layer, though, is responsible for uh, abstracting away some of the differences between the services, in particular, how instantiate different services, how to tear down the services of so the service lifecycle. Because yes, I can have you know, Spark 3.2 or 3.4 now is going to be provided by many services in many clouds, but the way API to instantiate these services, to start them, to tear them down, to specify the configuration parameters are different. So this will be abstracted away by, uh, by Sky, by in particular by InterCloud bro inter Broker. Also, Sky doesn't try to support all applications from the beginning, right? It's similar with serverless, actually. Serverless didn't try to start, to, to start by supporting everything from the beginning. It was this kind of trigger-based data processing, one of the main uh, use cases and application it was uh, uh, implementing very successfully. So you have new data landing in, in, the, in your bucket in the cloud, then you want to process it, and then new data comes, you process it, and so forth. So now, assuming the sky happens, then what? Why do you want even to do this work? Um, we do think that if sky happens, we'll have a lot of positive impact. First, we we'll lead to specialized clouds and accelerate the innovation. So you see, if a cloud is best for a particular workload. The intercloud broker will use it for that workload. So if a cloud is just the best for training, well, the training stage of your application can run on that cloud. A cloud doesn't need to provide all the services to have a seat of that as a table. It also makes it easier to integrate on-prem and edge clouds because the same reason, because this edge and, and on-prem and edge cloud, they have, by definition, less functionality. So you just can only run the components of the application for which, which matches the functionality provided by these um, on-prem clouds, on-prem on -prem data centers. So here is an example. Um, and actually, this is <laughs> happening today, as you know. You can have specialized clouds. Today, you have specialized GPU clouds. 
you have NVIDIA DGX Cloud, you have uh, Lambda Labs, uh, Core Wave, and so, ma so much, so many more. And then you may have you know, specialized clouds for storage, provide the best storage in the world, right? And these clouds actually can cooperate, can partner, can actually have uh, free peer agreements and even, and, um, um, and also you can have rent uh, dark uh, or lit fiber. So very high connectivity, right? You see, physically there is no reason to not have the same connectivity between two data centers from different clouds as between two data centers in the same cloud. Um, then you can also have these uh, companies like develop new chips, like Cerebras, right? They can rent a few racks uh, in, for instance, in Equinox, which has 200, 200 300 uh, data center across the world, and they can advertise their capabilities, again, say, for training or inference and to, to Sky, and Sky will push some of these jobs which do that inference or training to Cerebras chips. And if they are successful, you know, the revenue is going to grow and they are going to expand. Um, public clouds, other public clouds, like say IBM, can be part of the sky, can join the sky, and like I mentioned, edge and private clouds. The second thing that we believe that will accelerate the cloud adoption because it will remove some customer's concern like data and operations, sovereignty, lock-in, and things like that. Um, it's pretty much like the internet accelerates the growth of the networking industry. So actually, the pie will become bigger. So every cloud could benefit. We'll accelerate the growth of software platforms like AWS SageMaker, which is a very successful service, can run on different clouds, or maybe Azure Synapse, or more recently, Azure Fabrics. Um, and we are here, it's a research, we are researchers. I do believe that will impact many, many research topics, maybe similar to the way the internet impact is the networking research. And I'm not going to go through all of this, um, but almost every of these the problems in, every of this, in each of these areas, you can rethink a little bit, because now you need to deal with uh, different clouds, different administrative domains. Uh, the heterogeneity will increase significantly, and also you are going to, to try to start to focus on different metrics in addition to performance, for instance, like cost. Right? So far, everything I said, I, it was about clouds, multiple clouds. However, it turns out that Sky is very useful for a single cloud, okay? Because why? Because today it's not easy, it's not trivial to run your application across multiple regions in the same cloud. And the same advantages, almost, um, you have for, do, for, multiple cloud, for multiple clouds, you have for multiple regions in the same cloud. So, satisfy data and operation sovereignty? Well, you know, if you have regions or data center in a particular country, then you can do it. Leverage best of breed services and hardware? Yes, you can do it in, even in a single cloud because you know, the top, like hardware, is not rolled out at, in all regions at the same time. You can look, for instance, TPUs, Google, where are they available? They are available not only in a few regions, not only in all regions. So if you are running your application in a region which doesn't have this hardware, you still want the ability to send the components of the application which require that hardware transparently to the region which have, which have that hardware. Um, you can aggregate resources across regions, right? If you look, for instance, about spot instances, you can have a lot of more spot instances across many regions than in your own region. 
Um, it can reduce the cost and latency. For instance, again, you can go to regions which have spot instances. Uh, the only thing you cannot do it is avoid lock-in, because we are talking about the same cloud. So finally, let me take, tell you a little bit about our early experience with um, Sky. I'm going to talk about two projects, Sky Pilot and Sky Plane. So Sky Pilot, it's intercloud broker for machine learning application. You submit a job, you say what you need, like for instance, I need four V100 GPUs, and Sky will pick and run your job on the best cloud. So this is a typical, say, a very you know, trivial ML project. You do have a setup, specify some requirements, you do the pip install uh, for all these libraries, and then you start you know, Python train.pi. Um, at least right now, in Sky, what we have is you specify everything in a YAML file. You know? I'm sure we can do better than that, but this is what we do now. And you basically add the setup, the run command, uh, the working directory, not, and then you can also specify, like I mentioned, in this case, uh, V100, uh, I want four V100s, the accelerators. And then you run out. You run sky launch job.yaml, and what Sky will do, in this case, will pick the best cloud, provision, ship the code and data, and execute it. Execute the job. This is an intercloud broker. So again, SkyPilot is just an instantiation of an intercloud broker. Now, I presented you who are the intercloud, the main components. Of course, that was um, pretty much at the high level. If you go a little bit to lower level, there are a few more components in addition to the service catalog and the optimizer. You have here provisioner and executor. I'll tell you a little bit about those right now. So anyway, so again, the optimizer takes the application specification and then availability of the services, in this case of the resources from the service catalog, and is going to decide in this case you have the application, it's consisting of only one component, where to run that application, that job, on which cloud. Then when it's doing that, it's going to allocate resources on that cloud. This is a provisioner. And once you allocate resources on that cloud, it's going to uh, run the job on those services, on, the, on those resources. This is pretty much what happened. As an execution environment, SkyPilot for now is using Ray. So Ray, it's, as you know, it's another project, open source project. Uh, the goal of Ray is to scale machine learning applications, uh, one of the main primary goals. So it's using Ray because we are dealing with machine learning workloads, and many machine learning workloads they are going to use more than one GPUs and more, more than one nodes, and Ray is a convenient way to handle running these particular jobs. We have also uh, support for Docker experimentally and Kubernetes. It's actually even Kubernetes. It's in experimental right now. And in the future, we can have VMR and so forth. So again, here you are using, you, you, you leverage Ray, which can run on many clouds as open source as part of this compatibility set. So here is an example about what Sky is doing today. And this is Manaspot. You want to minimize the cost by running your applications, in this case, a training uh, job, or training the BERT network uh, on you know, a few days here. And this is a plot showing you the loss. The loss rate should go down. And each color represents a different um, region you are running on. So you start, and again, remember, you want to you minimize the cost. I want to run on spot instances. 
So I start running on AWS US VS2. And at some point, after a few hours, my spot resources are preempted. So what happens then? Well, Sky is going to find another region which has spot instances. In this case, AWS US Fast 2 c and is going to move to the job there. Here we are assuming that the job, the training job, takes the checkpoints. So we are going to start from the previous checkpoint. But at the few hours here, also our spot instances are preempted. So in this case, Sky is finding the spot instances in the previous region, US West to A, so going back in that region. But again, I am preempted, and now what happens is that, you know, Sky, okay, it's enough, go to GCP, and here, US Central A, and find spot instances, and can run until the end, uh, until it converges. So in this particular case, I used to use only spot instances. And because we use only spot instances, we reduce the cost by 70%, but with no real loss in performance or in time. The latency and end-to-end latency is still almost the same like if you are running on on-demand instances. What about the higher level services? So here it's about to use Apache Spark to do some data processing. And Apache Spark is provided in many, by many clouds. It, it's actually many uh, uh, diff uh, different clouds, actually, they have multiple offerings of, uh, of, um, of Spark. Right, you have uh, data proc, you have, uh, in AWS you have, uh, um, EMR, and on all of these clouds, you also have Databricks offering of Apache Spark and things like that. So here we are using only the cloud offerings. Um, and we are looking at GCP data proc and EMR, AWS. And for EMR, we are looking at using traditional Intel chips and uh, Graviton EMR, which, as you know, use ARM chips. <laughs> and on the left-hand side, you have the cost of running uh, the TPCDS benchmark on different configurations, right? On different hardware and different clouds and hardware. And as you know, the cheapest and actually the fastest is AWS uh, EMR on Gra Gra Graviton. So what it turns out now assumes that the data is on Google GCP. And in this case, it turns out that even after you do 1,000 queries, you amortize the cost of moving the data, right? Because here, you need to, if, if you want to run, if your data is on GCP, but it's cheaper to run on AWS, you need to take into account the cost of moving the data and amortize to do enough work on AWS to amortize that cost. Um, so you can see here um, the yellow black hashed small bar represents the cost of moving the data. And um, other than that, you have for different number of queries, the more queries you are going to do, the more work we are going to do. In this case on AWS Graviton, the more you are going to gain in terms of cost reduction. So one of the most uh, surprising and you know, um, things that happened um, it is, you remember I was talking about this kind of the market uh, will help us when we start. Um, and uh, it did, actually, in this case. Uh, so this is what we are very happy to see. So we started with these three clouds. Um, obviously, the three big clouds, AWS, Azure, and GCP, and since then, we added four more clouds, uh, Lambda Labs, IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud, and Samsung SDS Cloud. And the last three were added by these companies. So you can see because this, of course, the machine learning workloads 
are a pretty popular workloads these days. You know, many clouds um, started to add support to Sky because it's much easier for people who are running their workloads on other clouds to run now on their clouds. It's, you know, it's still a very early project, still, you know, reasonably successful. And we had a lot of interesting application running on top of it. Of course, I, I to mention about training. We have bioinformatic jobs on spot instances we run. This is from Salk Institute, San Diego. Um, a lot of other interesting applications. So one I would mention is this uh, Vicuna uh, large language model. You know, I need to mention about that during these days. Um, it's a high quality open source chatbot we released a two, two months ago. Now it's all, all, already it's all news. Um, it was trained on Skypilot for $300 and um, so on spot instances. So that was Skypilot. The next is Skypline. So Skypline is about moving data. If you want to move to run a job on a different cloud from where the data is. If you want to have different components of your job run on different clouds, you need to move the data, right? And moving the data can be slow and can be uh, expensive because, as you know, the clouds have egress, egress fees. And some of the egress fees are very high. Um, I will not go into mention, but there are clouds, some big clouds, like for instance, the cost of moving one byte of data to get out of the cloud, it's equivalent to storing that byte for several months on that blob store, on the blob store in that cloud. So as an example here, let's say you want to transfer data from UAE North to North Virginia. And the transfer, it turns out, is slow, um, which can significantly impact your end-to-end -end job performance. So what do we do? Well, many of us remember about uh, resilient overlay networks and uh, overlay networks. This is what we do. What is the difference? Well, two differences. We have more degrees to optimize over more dimensions. And then another, another difference is that now cost, it's one of the major metrics you want to optimize for. So what do you do? First, you can do overlay routing that I mentioned. So instead of sending directly, it turns out that if you send the data through Mumbai, it's going to be much faster, right? This is what overlay networks are doing. Now, you can have multiple VMs per region. Why? Because you throttle the, you know, the clouds. You have a certain capacity associated with each VM in terms of network capacity. So if you add more capacity, you add more VMs. Of course, you can use parallel TCP connection. right? You can use that as well to improve the throughput. And you can also uh, select different network tiers. There are clouds which provides uh, both of the option to use hot potato routing and cold potato routing. And <laughs> hot potato means that when they try to get, if the destination is not in that cloud, they try to get rid of that packet as soon as possible to get it out. And uh, cold potato, it's just keeping the packet as much as possible in their cloud. Um, and uh, hot potato is cheaper by 40%. So you can put all of this together, you can, pretty, you can get pretty good performance. Uh, this is uh, a Skyplane compared with AWS DataSync, which provides a similar service to transfer your data between different uh, regions um, in AWS, uh, S3 data. And as you can see um, here between different uh, regions across the globe, um, Skyplane is doing better, but also more interestingly, also obviously it's working in all situations, while data sync is not working in all situations. OK? So um, it's OK. It's an early project. Um, um, you know, 20 something contributors who is used by a few organizations. 
Um, and, uh, but it's again, it's, it's a beginning. And there are many, many other projects I don't have the time to uh, mention here. Well, to go over them here is Cloudcast. It takes not only, um, uh, it provides the ability not only to move the, to send the data between um, two endpoints. It's about, this is about replicating an object across different clouds, across different regions. As Kai spot, um, it's a problem about I want a job to be, fin to be done by a certain time um, with a minimal cost. Uh, Starburst integrates the on-prem clusters to Sky. Sky identity, I didn't talk about that. It's a very important problem uh, about identity management. It tries to provide a layer across different clouds. Obviously, Sky storage, multi-cloud storage, it's a lot of uh, interesting work there. Uh, and FastChat, it's training, it's an application, Sky application, which using Sky to train um, this large language model, like I mentioned. So, in summary, um, Sky aims to abstract away clouds and regions in the same cloud without demanding uniform APIs. Um, it's just leveraging existing services, uh, and it le leverages services at different layers, right, across the stack. It's not only low-level services. Um, we start narrow, narrowly with batch workloads, machine learning workloads, and we believe that there is a lot of exciting research touching, which touches almost every area in computer science, which you know, I hope to do all together. Thank you.